Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. This is your host, Colin Cattell. Returning guest on the program today is Daniel Major. He is the CEO of Goviax Uranium and, of course, has been on the show with us numerous times to talk about the uranium market. Daniel, welcome back to the program. Uh, Colin, thanks for the invite back. And it, it is certainly an interesting time, I think, to be talking about uranium again. Certainly. We've had some uh, less discussions of late about uranium because I didn't want to exhaust our listener base while things were flat and sideways. But the excitement certainly seems to be picking back up just in the last few weeks. Uh, aside from the spot price moving up, you've got many companies effectively coming back to market and raising money through private placements. So let's start there, Daniel. Where do you see the market at this point? Yeah, I certainly think from an investment point of view, there's a, a lot more enthusiasm in the last month or so where we're finding interest, obviously, under the placements. I've had companies, investment groups that normally would have not talked to us suddenly become very interested. Uh, we've done a couple of um, conferences, one-to-one -one conferences, where I'm getting 20 meetings over two days. I mean, absolutely packed out meetings, um, finding no problem filling slots. So I certainly think from an investment point of view, um, your longer investors are getting a lot more interested at this time than we've seen them for quite some time. Now, I still maintain that we actually had a bottom uh, probably about a year and a half ago, but as is oftentimes cases, it's hard to really feel the bottom because it can be quite subtle. Uh, many of the terms coming out on these financings don't include things like full warrants, certainly not five-year warrants, uh, which tells me that this time as the market picks up, uh, it's probably going to attract a lot more buyers and we might see uh, a more significant move than we did last time. Oh, I agree with you. I mean, even in our own, we've shortened the warrants and the warrants are becoming more ratcheted up as well. So we're not giving just a single price. Uh, we're ratcheting prices up and we're seeing that with other companies as well. And you can see why. I mean, the, the the underlying market is probably as good as it's been for a long term. And you're right, you, you guys got the bottom, but unfortunately, we stayed flatlining for quite some time. Um, and, you know, it, it's always been a case of when was this thing going to, to get going? Um, and I think the positive that you see when you, you look at the whole overlying, you know, we had that problem back in 2011 with Fukushima where... The market went into oversupply because you lost so much demand capacity with the, um, the Japanese and the Germans. And it's taken a while to pull everything back. I think if you look on the demand side, at least you are in a position where you are generating as much uh, nuclear energy as we were back in um, 2011. You've got the fastest um, and most aggressive reactor build strategy going on globally um, that we've seen in 25 years, and it's accelerating. Uh, we've seen an acceleration of Japanese restarts, um, which I know always for Rick Rule was going to be his trigger. We're now at eight um, up and going and 20 under application. And only a few weeks ago, the government reiterated its 20% to 25% nuclear generation as a percentage of total uh, power generation. But I think more interesting, and we, you know, I, I've said this thing before on your radio. We are, have been seeing this gradual trend, particularly in the U.S. market and the European market, of um, stabilization. Um, the the negative stories have been going away, and I think we've obviously seen that more re recently with the Trump government now physically demanding that reactors not be shut down, uh, and that you know systems be put in place. Um, to stabilize it. More aggressive than we've seen before, where states have actually changed their taxation systems or subsidies to support reactors. You know, you're now getting a federal demand that reactors be protected. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think the logical way. I, I saw a report the other day which highlighted um, domestic power costs in Europe, and they were directly correlated to the amount of renewables in each country. So the higher the renewables, the higher the domestic power price. So you can understand why um, governments are doing this as well. Um, so, you know, I think the three to four percent annualized growth that most people predict for, for nuclear, I think, is is still very much on the cards. I mean, we always have to be cautious. These are um, big Titanic projects. Um, but importantly, some of the more newer projects are coming on. The first ERP was started up in China just a couple of days ago, a new, new design. So 
you know, that's a positive um, coming through. But I think the biggest change has been the supply side um, uh, and what's been going on. I mean, when this cycle turned down, there were some initial production cuts. It took a long time to see anything really cutting. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk there really on the, the these contracts that were sitting out, you know, 207 to 211. They just protected people's margins. Um, and there's been a lot of talk from the industry about how the the position on those contracts is going to unwind. Um, but we're now getting to that point where the cliff edge is coming and contracts do need to be replaced um, going forward. Um, you've also seen with the, the increase in production and the um, increase in demand places from like Japan coming on stream, a squeeze on the, the enrichment capacity. Um, you've seen Urenco shutting down capacity, and that is starting to affect the amount of underfeeding coming to the market um, and reducing that in the secondary. You've had the government of the US um, decide that it's no longer going to allow the DOE to sell five million pounds to feed um, and support the environmental um, refurbishment. So that's coming out. Um, and that UXC consulting, I see are predicting you got like 50 million pounds of um, supply reducing to 35 million pounds over the next five years. That's 15 million pounds. I mean, that, that's from a Carter River or, or a, a Cigar Lake. Uh, it's going to just steadily disappear. Um, and I think the other side of this is, and, the, you know, and you and I have talked as well, longer term, you've got about 30 million pounds of production disappearing over the next five to 10 years of projects that have come to the end of their life. And so the long term looks good. What's happening in the short term, I think, is what's really interesting. You know, I think you and I talked at the beginning of this year and you, you asked me what would happen on the uranium price. And I said, well, the first half is going to be nothing. Uh, it'll be, all happen in the second half. And the premise of that it was always going to be along the lines of, uh, of what Cameco does. Because, you know, Cameco announced a production cut at the end of last year, but it only really kicked in at the beginning of this year. But what they made clear is it really wasn't going to be a supply cut at the beginning because they had to work through their own inventories and they had to bring that inventory level down and they could meet their contracts out of inventory. And only at the end of that, if the price had not recovered, would they actually come into the spot market. And they've made it very clear that they that there is no point in um, – producing uranium and i was reading something the other day that has it at what 90 dollars a pound if you can buy it at, at 29 dollars a pound sorry um if you can buy it at 23 in the market there's just no point um so they may as well make money by buying in the market and selling it into their contracts uh, than digging it out of the ground um and i think the other factor that for for cameco is that cameco's book when you look at it is about $45 out to 2021. Well, you know, 2021 is only three years away. Um, and Cameco, uh, as a company, like all of us, that term contract is all about what you can replace your resources at. And Cameco need, you know, and term contracts at 31. Now, Cameco need to make sure that if they're going to maintain their long-term development of uranium projects to meet long-term contracts, they have got to get a term contract that's better than $45 a pound um, to keep their projects going. Um, and so that has to be in their site. So I think what you've got now is a Cameco going to be coming into the market later this year. Um, you can expect MacArthur River to be extended um, considerably. Um, I certainly think in the next two months we'll hear something from that. But at the same time, you've had Kyla um, Langer Heinrich shut um, or going into care and maintenance um, in the last month. That's about three to four million pounds a year uh, of spot material that won't be there for someone like a Cameco to go and buy. Uh, you've had the Kazakhs announce another cut, which is about another three million pounds. And at the same time, you've had Yellow Cake PLC turning up in the market as an IPO wanting to buy eight million pounds from the Kazakhs uh, as well. And so, you know, your, some of your sources of spot material are, are starting to disappear. And I think the other thing, and you and I have discussed this a couple of times on the thing, which is the inventory number, this, you know, dreaded inventory number. And we've always said, you know, half the inventory is depleted uranium anyway, held by the governments. And the rest is strategically held by the power utilities. And 
What has been interesting in the last year, utilities in France and Europe are reportedly reduced on their inventory levels. They haven't been going up, they should have been coming down as they've been trying to use some of them. Um, but what was interesting, and it's a point I think you and I have already discussed, is if you look at their total inventory level, how much of it's actually really fungible? How much, if somebody wanted to go and buy it, how much of it could somebody go and get their hands on, unless you wanted to pay a stupid price that was actually just strategic material? And UXC have now put a number to that, and, and it's, it's down at you know, 20 to 30 million pounds in total. Um, you know, if somebody was willing to sell and they get a price. And I think the other thing I noted at the beginning of this year, you know, there was a report from, from one of the consultancy groups indicating that 75% of all material bought and sold is between traders. So it's actually just swaps um, going on. Uh, again, showing there's actually not a lot of depth in the market. So I think we are at a point that um, we are starting to see um, the utility starting to worry about where metal is going to come from. Um, and that is starting to, to feed into the psyche um, as well. And I, so I, I'm certainly of a view that, you know, once you see Cameco turning up spot in the spot market, looking for material and sucking it in, and the more they buy, the more inventory they're disappearing and there's less available. And when you look forward, um, and one of the consultancy um, research analysts put a piece out yesterday, which has it flat, balanced market for next year and then 25 and then 35 million pound deficits the following year but he's assumed macarthur river was back into production which it won't be and even he says it won't be so if you take that out you're, you're basically looking for an 18 to 20 million pound deficit next year um which clearly you know the market needs that material so i, I think we are in a very different place um than we have been for quite some time and, and we're certainly getting quite interested by where it's going well, Daniel, every mine and every project has a different cost to production, uh, but if you look across the industry, none of them are making money at current prices. None of them were making money at $18, and almost none of them will be making money at 30 And that brings me to the point that commodities, when they start moving, uh, they might move con consistently and slowly for some time, but then all of a sudden you'll wake up one day and the price of uranium might have jumped 6 or $8 dollars. Uh, in a week. That's happened before numerous times in the last cycle. So um, is that something that you expect is going to come uh, in form of surprise to many investors in the near term? Yeah, I think it is. And I think that's the one thing that's always confused us in our industry. We, I mean, I used to be an analyst. And, you know, the, the mantra was always, you know, most commodities dropped in base metals till the, the, you'd got to the first de decile, the top decile had gone out of production. And that was always where you drop it back down to because you can lose 10%, but then the market's already too tight. In the, and as you point out, uh, you know, other than a couple of Kazakh fields, pretty well everybody else in the industry is, out of, you know, is, is loss making at the current price. So uranium had got itself into a completely crazy position. The, the, but we had this problem with these contract prices, which were just, you know, it was an unreal position that, the spot price was down at one level at 20, but people were still selling at, at 50 and 60. Um, and that is unwinding both here and in the enrichment units as well. So it is starting to, to, to bite in. And I think more importantly, it required the market to get itself into a proper deficit. Uh, and that is where we are now. And we've seen inventories dropping across the board in, in things like US6 inventories are reported declining because of Convidane's actions. Um, uh, at the end of last year, shutting down their operations with Urenco's reductions in enrichment, that squeezing inventories now. So we are seeing a squeeze of inventories across the whole pipeline. And um, I think that's why we've now got to this point that there actually isn't a lot of material free. Guys can buy their material on their contracts, but those contracts are now unwinding. Uh, they don't have massive inventories. They're kind of historical norms now. Um, and therefore, if it's going to get worse and you're getting this increasing decline in production, then where are you going to get your material from? Um, and this is going to be the challenge when you can imagine a scenario when the big off takers are sitting there staring across the table at the pr big producers saying, well, the term contract's 31 and the term got, the producer's just going to say, well, there's no bloody way I'm selling it to you for that. You know, you're going to have to up the price, guys. Um, 
And that's that will happen. And that will happen. And if it doesn't, the spot price will be moving up. The available material will be declining sharply. People will become desperate in the spot market looking for material they can't get under contract. And it will become self-fulfilling. They will get the contract they want because the spot price will have moved. Excellent. Well, on that note, last question for you, uh, for many listeners who are shareholders of GoVX, uh, including ourselves, what's the update there? Um, the update there, obviously, um, we've been sorting out uh, our, our balance sheet, getting that ready and tidied up. Um, I have got the um, proposals in from a number, number of consultancy groups now ready to get the feasibility study um, underway. Um, we obviously have to choose which one of those we want to use. But you know, that's always been along the strategy for us, which is as soon as we start to see uh, an underpinned uranium price that we can feel has you know, got some legs to it and we're starting to get to that point, uh, then we will get on with doing the feasibility study. Uh, we will continue to, uh, but more aggressively, uh, work with the, the lending banks, um, get those MLAs appointed, um, get on with the due diligence with the lending banks, um, and do what we've always said, which is push these projects that we have um, towards development and construction. So, you know, we're looking at one year to get those feasibility studies and lending structures out of the way we're doing what we can still to optimize those projects um you know we announced that those improvements we saw from nanofiltration or membrane separation those are very positive for us um and th on the back of that you know get into construction so you know and, and that's always been govx's strength has been that a fact that we have permitted projects we can if this market reacts positively we can benefit from it we can leverage up and build our minds and that makes it very different from our peers where the majority of them do not have um, their permits and are basically going to be waiting some considerable time to go through that costly process um, to being able to achieve that so really you see this market continue Colin will be putting out press releases telling you where we're going with regarding the development of matter and on Matanga. Excellent. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the program as always and get you back on here in the next few months. Absolute pleasure, Colin. Thanks for inviting me back. Think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people? Hit the bit. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?